Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to the second session of today's session on questions and answers. I'm Amjad Muhammad, that's what it says on there, so let's take that to be the truth. And uh, we're going to be looking at some more questions and answers over the next 20 minutes or so. Which number do you need to call to get through? Well, ring the same number the two sisters called just before the break. That's 01274 214 299. I don't mean that the two were actually sisters in the sense that they were blood related, but they are sisters in Islam. So in that way, they are sisters in case somebody said, oh, that's interesting. He got a call from two sisters. I wonder what that was about. So it's not, it's two separate sisters. Uh, that doesn't mean that they were sisters and they are now separate. No, they are two people who are not sisters, blood related, but they're sisters based on it. You know, when you try to explain something and it gets more and more confusing, the more you explain it. So sometimes what they say is, you know, you're digging a ditch for yourself. So let's just leave it where it is. Put the spade away and carry on with what I was doing. So if you want to call in 01274 214 299. And now is a good time to call because we've got the bulk of the uh, session to respond to that question. Like we did uh, take up a lot of time to respond to the uh, organ donation question. And uh, obviously then, you know, the time just flies. If, however, on the other hand, you wish to email, then please email on qanda at iqra.tv. That's qanda at iqra.tv. And we will get your questions answered live here. Okay, so whilst we wait for the first call to come in, let me deal with some of the questions that I've already received um, on via the questions. Um, where are we? So here we go. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A father passes away, leaving a son and a daughter, and had divorced their mother when they were young. So a father's passed away, he leaves a son and daughter, he'd already divorced their mother when they were young. He since remarried someone who already had children. The son and the daughter do not want any of their dad's inheritance and made intention to gift it to the second wife and her kids. It is not known how much inheritance was left, but will this intention suffice for the family to use? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So as I understand it, a man passes away, he's left behind a son and daughter, and a, he had divorced their mother, obviously, whilst he was alive. He then married somebody else, and this other person, his second wife, let's call it, uh, let's call her, and she had children. Now, the son and daughter from his first marriage, they do not want any of their father's inheritance, and they've made intention to gift it to the second wife and her kids. So we don't know how much the inheritance is. Will this intention suffice for the family to use? Absolutely. What, they, what would happen is that the inheritance would be taken by uh, any wife he has. So the second wife is his wife, so she will take the inheritance. And also any children, and that would be the children from, her from his first marriage, because they're still his children. So they will take the inheritance. Any share the son and daughter don't want, so when they receive the inheritance, if they don't want it, they can gift it to whoever they please, because it's no longer inheritance anymore. As soon as they took possession of it, it became their mal, their property, and they are, can do with their property as they choose. They can give it to whoever they want, and that's absolutely fine. Bear in mind, obviously, in terms of the inheritance, the first thing that should be dealt with is his burial costs. After his burial costs, it should be any outstanding debts he has, and then it should be any bequest he made. He can make up to a third, from a third of his wealth, a bequest. But a bequest can only be received by those people who cannot receive inheritance. Then whatever remains is the inheritance, and that inheritance is, as I said, would be divided. I'm assuming he doesn't have parents alive, so they would not get anything. He has a wife that's alive, which is, as we understand it, his second wife, and he has a son and daughter from the first wife. So the wife will receive funds, and the son and daughter will receive funds, and that's how it will be split. So we're just talking about organ donation. We've got a question here. Okay, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In light of the recent pig heart transplant, uh, is it permissible in Islam to have such a transplant from any animal, if it were possible, from a pig? Okay. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In terms of a fatwa, you normally give a fatwa to a specific circumstance in a specific situation. Hence, giving an answer would be for a particular individual in a particular circumstance. 
Here, let's just speak about it in a more theoretical way. In terms of theoretical, can we take a transplant from an animal uh, that would become similar to the sort of consumption of an animal. So again, if it's a, you know, if this transplant is something which is being developed in a laboratory or if it's being taken from an animal, uh, how it was taken from the animal, obviously the blood will be considered as nudges and things of that nature. Can he place something nudges inside of him? Then there would be the other argument of the issue of uh, uh, medical need, haja in which we can use impure matters. So there may be an argument to be made, but like I said, this is all theoretical. As with regards to a pig, this would be somewhat of an issue um, because of the fact of it being Najis Ulain, something which can never be purified, never be cleansed. There is no way to do so. Hence, I would say that that would be something that would be impermissible. Having said that, okay, having said that, you know, again, in a very specific circumstances, it may be some ulama may consider it to be permissible, but let's just leave it on that theoretical position for now. And that deals with those questions on there. We've got about 10, 12 minutes, ladies and gents. So if you have a question, please do uh, get your call in because now is the time to be able to answer it. Okay, we've got one question here on the sisters group. Assalamu alaikum of sub. I've heard people saying that if we don't make three alif mad in the la of kalima tayyiba, then the meaning changes to there are other deities other than Allah. How far is it correct? Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The key thing is to recite it by giving it more wazan, giving it a longer duration than just lam fatha, like la, la, like we say a, ba, ta, tha. So give it longer than that. So if it's a, ba, ta, tha, la. So as long as the la is there, then la. There's a clear definition between the two, then it will suffice. Uh, you know, that, that's the key thing, that's the key difference to bring. Fantastic, that answers uh, all of our questions that have come in through the two forums. So Alhamdulillah, that's been dealt with. So now let's just ask my colleague if any questions have come in uh, through our social media uh, platform in terms of our um, emails. And uh, he's going to put one or two up, he says to me. So let's let him give him some time to put these one or two questions up whilst I take a, a bit of coffee. So whilst he's rummaging through his electronic files and copy and pasting this for me to read, um, let's just continue to just talk about the whole concept of you know, leaders and leaders being true to their word and leaders always, you know, demonstrating by example. One of the signs, obviously, of the end of days is we have, you know, unfortunately many, many leaders who want to tell us what to do but don't want to do that themselves. And I think that's, a, that's an issue. Uh, and, you know, and this is why we, we live in the times we live, and that's why you get people going against rules and going against laws, because they say, well, it's one rule for those who are giving the rules, and it's another rule for those who have to behave by the rules. And this two-tier society comes about, you know, the leaders and the followers. And unfortunately, you know, even though we're such an advanced society, such an advanced community here in the UK, um, and, you know, so civilized as we perceive ourselves, it clearly shows that we also behave in that same manner. And, uh, you know, when you can get away with something, you get away with it. And that's, you know, unfortunate to say the least. And, you know, we need to, uh, uh, you know, we need to go out of our way especially if we have any position of leadership, whatever it might be, whether we're responsible for the house, whether we're responsible for a community, whether we're responsible for a football team, you know, young Sunday league under 10s or something, whatever it might be. It doesn't have to be imam of a masjid. You know, we always take, you know, whenever we speak about religious or religion, we always take it to the religious people 
or religious environments. We seem to think that Islam doesn't act or we don't have to behave according to Islam uh, outside of the religious circles. It's as though Islam only lives in masjids and, and madrasas and it doesn't live in you know, offices and, and uh, factories and you know, laboratories and classrooms. Islam is from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep, whatever activity you're engaged in. Islam has a position on all those matters. So, you know, it's unfortunate that we, you know, so whether you, you, whether you are in charge of a five-a-side football team and you might think, what has Islam got to do with me running a Sunday league under 10s team? You'd think nothing. So much. So much. You have the responsibility for nurturing the young, speaking honestly. If you say turn up at such a time, you turn up at that time yourself before you expect others to turn up. You know, not using foul language, rewarding good behaviour, giving a chance for that person who works that extra bit harder, not always looking at ability, but also looking, you know, so many ways Islam plays a part. And it's essential that we understand that. Anyway, he's found the question, and what a question it is as well. Okay. Should aqiqah be offered for an illegitimate child? Ya Allah. I've never come across a question, that sort of question before. Never come across that question before. Uh, so I can't, from a juz'i, yani, I've not read that question and read its response anywhere. So I'm going to respond to it in a general way. And uh, aqiqah is offered as a kind of thanksgiving, for want of a better phrase. Shukr. You're expressing shukr to Allah that Allah has bestowed upon you a child. That's what you're doing. So you're expressing shukr to Allah that he has bestowed upon you a child. Uh, and therefore, you take an animal, you slaughter the animal, and then you share that meat uh, across with family and relatives and friends. Now, if a person has, a, has had an illegitimate child, then the question comes up that either the lady has had an affair um, or a couple, a young man and young woman, before marriage have had intimacy. So, in either case, in one case, if the lady has had an affair, if, uh, if she's a married woman and her husband knows no better and he thinks he is the father of the child, then obviously he will do aqiqah. If the woman tells her husband that this is not your child, okay, then I find it very difficult that if a woman is going to engage in that kind of behavior activity, that she's now going to be concerned about whether to do aqiqah for that child if she's having an affair. So that's why I find it uh, a question, you know, more theoretical than a real question. In the second scenario, if there is a couple, girlfriend, boyfriend, partners living together outside of nikah, and they have a child, and they now are looking at whether they should do aqiqah or not, then again the question would come up that they recognize this child to be illegitimate because a question has said, illegitimate child. So they recognize this child is born outside of wedlock, born outside of marriage. And then it has to consider whether they consider nikah to be a valuable bond between two people. If they consider nikah to be a valuable bond, uh, then it's not an issue. Uh, but if they see nikah to be a valuable bond, then why would they not have performed nikah? Why would they have gone to, you know, neither of them are married, so they're not having a secret affair, so they both can get married. So at least it legitimizes their relationship and legitimizes those children. So what I'm saying in essence is that there's no basis really for this situation to come up. If it did come up and somebody said, should we do aqiqah, then should you be giving thanksgiving uh, or being grateful to Allah uh, on the back of the fact that you've had a child uh, outside of wedlock, either because you've had an affair or be because you've not married. So what, what gratitude are you expressing to Allah in his disobedience? So that would be somewhat kind of, you know, uh, you know as the phrase goes, rubbing salt in someone's wound. So it's not, it's not something that would be... Uh, uh, required if from a Sharia perspective and this is what I'm saying it's a bit of a, a strange one because if they're so concerned and remember Akika is a sunnah it is not farb 
So that they're so concerned about sunnah and not so concerned about fard, which is that, you know, they need to get married. And also they're not concerned about the religious implications of uh, zina and uh, what is the consequence of zina. So, so I'll answer it in that way uh, in, in, in regards to that particular question. So I hope that uh, has uh, got. And if this, you know, if this is a legitimate question and it's a legitimate scenario, then I would reach out to the brother and sister and say, look, you know, if it's a woman who has is having an affair out of wedlock and her husband doesn't know, then you know, if it's not the man you want to be with, then ask him to divorce you and, and marry the other man. Simple as that. Uh, similarly, if it's a man who's having an affair with a married woman. Uh, then again, if you know, if, he, if the two are happy, if the woman, the married woman, and him, who's a single man, want to live together, then again, the woman should go and ask her husband for divorcing. I don't love you anymore. I got no no interest in you whatsoever. I don't want to live with you. I don't want to have a life with you. And then she can move on. Sharia permits divorce. It doesn't permit zina. And in another scenario, when it's a couple who aren't married, then similarly, that couple, what they should do is obviously they should. Get married, you know, and if they say, yeah, but we don't want to commit to each other, whatever. Well, you've already committed to each other. You're living together. You've had a child together. What more of a commitment are you after? And the guy, at the end of the day, is just a, you know, it's just a statement. Um, you know, the responsibilities which come with nikah come with living together. There's no difference. It's just that it's a different method of a couple living together. That's all. You know, people say, yeah, but marriage is deep. How? You know, I don't understand. It's just a, you're just making a statement and that you're agreeing to live together, it's exactly like the statement you've made to yourselves when you decided to live together. What's the difference? One is, it's permissible, from a Sharia perspective, there's a big difference. One is, it's permissible, and the other one is impermissible. Simple as that. And if a person says, well, yeah, you know, that's a bit strange. So if I don't do nikah, I do exactly the same thing, it's impermissible. But if I do nikah and, and, I, and I do exactly the same thing, it's permissible. That's a bit strange. I say, well, yeah, I get you a chicken burger from a halal shop and I get you a chicken burger from a non-halal shop, they look exactly the same if they've got the exact salad dressing on it, they look exactly the same. Why don't you eat that one? Because you know it's haram and you will eat that one because it's halal. Same thing here. The one relationship is halal and one relationship is haram. Anyway, on that point, Jazak Munakhena for listening. I'm going to be away for a couple of days because there's a, uh, an appeal, I think, uh, tomorrow, inshallah. And on Friday, we have the... Uh, Q factor, so uh, watch those instead. And all being well, I will return here on Wednesday next following week. So till then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.